so many bodies. <laughs> Which reminds me of the song Let the Bodies Hit the Floor, which I think that needs to be somewhere <laughs> in this episode. Let Please, producer Brian. Thank you. All right, I'll put it right here. Hello. Do you want to play a game? What's your favorite scary movie? Be afraid. Be very afraid. You're going to need a bigger boat. Here's Johnny. The power of Christ compels you. The power of Christ compels you. Whatever you do. Don't fall asleep. Welcome to Talking Horror with Jim and Nikisha. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jamie. And I'm Nikisha, and this is Talking Horror with Jamie. And Nikisha. Where we share our love for all things scary and talk horror through the lens of human behavior. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> still continuing on in our Pride era because it is still Pride Month. So happy Pride to everyone. Today Ooh. we are talking about the 2022 American comedy horror film, Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Let's talk about the film. This film was directed and written by uh, Helena Ryan, if I'm saying that correctly. If I'm not, please correct me. With a screenplay by Sarah DeLapp, and it stars... Amanda Steinberg, Maria Bakalova, uh, Bakalova uh, my, wow, I'm not doing any of these names justice right now. Um, Myla Harold, Chase Sue Wonders, Rachel Sinnott, Lee Pace, and of course, the one and only Pete Davison is in this. <laughs> Such a fun time. So heavy spoilers for Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. You can watch it on Netflix. Uh, it is up there for your perusal. So if you have not watched it, press pause on this. Go watch it on the Netflix or your friends' accounts or if you can get into your friends' accounts anymore because Netflix is crazy now. And then come back and listen to this. And Jamie, hit us with those trigger warnings. This movie features murder. Or is it? <gasps> dun, dun, dun. But there oh, is no. a lot of death. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there is a lot of... I mean, there is actually a murder. Um a bludgeoning uh yes there there is a a throat slashing um there is a falling down the flight of stairs and, mm -hmm. and uh, yes mm -hmm. tbz how death occurs there's a shooting um Lots. there's a falling off of uh another flight of stairs um over a railing and dying from that um Eek. So a lot of a lot of deaths, and then there's a lot of references to drug use and sex and manipulation and mm -hmm. gaslighting and mental health and uh, wealthy folks and their trust funds, mm. um, uh, podcasts, <laughs> uh, great line. Uh, games that creates a lot of conflict and tension in relationships um just generally really unhealthy relationship dynamics yes <laughs> everyone is kind uh, of terrible so <laughs> yeah if you if you're triggered by like being beholden to a friend group that does not serve you anymore this movie will set you off for sure for <laughs> sure <laughs> toxic relationships man woof get out of them if you can mm -hmm. yes Anything um, else? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. But this is also this is my brain on. I I block out unpleasant things. But I think I yes. I think I I think I got all of them. Yeah. If you're afraid of kettlebells, maybe mm -hmm. not for you. You know. Yes. Yeah. Lots and lots of blood in the sword. Hmm. Yes. <clears throat> but let's get into it. Producer Brian, give us some words so that we can start talking about this, please. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to say, first of all, podcast takes a lot of work, okay? You have to organize <laughs> the guests. You have to do a Google calendar, and you have to build a following. It takes a long fucking time, and I've been working on it for a while. Favorite line, and that's what I put in my likes and gripes. But this movie is so quotable oh, and wonderful. God. I have body Brian dysmorphia. Oh, shut start. the fuck up, Alice. <laughs> I, I demanded that Brian start by saying that line. Oh, yes. So good. Oh, it takes so a good. lot of work, guys, which is why we ask you to give us five stars and, and review our things. 
please thank you. Uh, please and, uh, we're just <laughs> having a good time with our really smart we're just friends. doing our best <laughs> Uh, what is her podcast about? Her podcast is about hanging out with your smartest and funniest friends. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yes, that is Did that's you... essentially what our podcast. Is. <laughs> Did you just groan? <laughs> oh, oh my god, that this. Oh, uh, it's. Oh my god. Did you just shoot me? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, so good. Anyway, um, uh, you can also find us on all social media at Talk Horror Pod. Um. Follow us on TikTok, on Twitter, on Instagram, and then you can, of course, find us on YouTube. Hi, YouTube. What's up? Uh, find us there for, up? for more uh, horror content. Fantastic. Yes. Well, I do have to tell you all that I watched a few things um, because I've just been bored. For the first time, I watched bored Practical Magic. Bored. Oh, my God. Oh. Wait, yes. Nikisha, that's so fucking weird because I... <laughs> I was like five seconds away from watching that movie this week. Well, because they and announced they the have. sequel. And then I didn't. I don't know why. I don't know what I ended up doing instead. Wait, that's yes. so weird. How yeah. How did... Oh, my God. That's, it's that's cancer brain. Strange. Yeah. It's, that's so weird. Well, they also really just announced a sequel, so I'm sure like it was in your subconscious. Yes. I Maybe. mean, but, you know, I, I've been seeing stuff about the sequel, but I've never been enticed to watch it. And I think I was just scrolling through to find something else and saw that it was available for in one of my many streaming apps that I have and thought, okay, well, I'm just going to watch this. And I thought, hmm. oh my gosh, if I would have watched this when I was little, like I would have been obsessed. I would have been running around like a little witch, like doing all the things, even though I did dress up as a witch for uh, Halloween is the, the child <laughs> picture that we all share for Halloween. Um, but I really enjoyed my time watching it and it's, Put me in the nice cozy fall spirit so it was really mm. fun the uh complete opposite spectrum of that i watched the stop motion picture mad god oh yeah Ooh. and it took me th three days to get through that hour and a half of it it just wasn't, really not for you it was it wasn't for me as much as i love stop motion and i love gore and it's basically just one hour and a half long nightmare of the most gruesome nasty disgusting little animated things uh, because there was no through line for it i was mm. just i got bored like every 30 minutes i was like oh my god there's more to to this <laughs> interesting and i think the perfect i was looking on rotten tomatoes to see you know just what the vibe was and one audience member reviewed it as it's impressive because it took so long to do, but what the fuck did I just watch? And that's exactly sure. what I felt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. About it. Have y'all seen it? No. It's on my okay. list. Yeah. No. I I mean, you know, for it being what it is and how long it took him to do this, I think it is worth a watch. But overall it just was was not for me. Sure. And of course, I've been watching The Boys. That's horror in itself. It's a side mm -hmm. note of that, but that's been fantastic. Oh, we need to start that. We're very behind. Mm -hmm. Oh, guys. Yes, no, well, this season, I mean. This, we, no, right, we've, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have to watch. Yeah, we're, we, we've watched seasons one and through three or whatever it is. We did not watch Gen V. Um, it's mm -hmm. excellent as well. Mm -hmm. Very excited okay. about that season two of that. But also, random fact, I was trying to find like... Uh, suggestions for this movie that we're watching and i randomly found that there is a movie that came out right after scary movie the wayne's brother scary movie but it was a comedy uh parody called shriek if you know what i did last friday the 13th have you guys ever heard of that yes, yes but, I've, but never I've never seen it. it yeah i now want to watch it but i was like <laughs> what the hell is this and it literally, like, Scary Movie came out in July, and this movie came out in October, and it was straight to video. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But it's just so interesting that they're, they came out in the same year, and it's the exact same. They both follow Scream. That's uh, wild. And it's just wild. And it said, like, S Scary Movie's original name was, like, Scream, if you know what I did last Halloween. So it's just like really crazy. It's similar in titles, and it came out in the same year. But I just thought that yeah. was just interesting. People I feel like that happens comedy. a lot. Like so Deep Impact and Armageddon and mm. Mars Attacks and uh, Independence Day 
and um mm -hmm. the illusionist and the prestige there are like a lot of examples oh, of yeah. that coming out around each other um, yeah so yeah. wow but i definitely want to watch it just to see i mean every review said it was absolutely terrible but it's like i feel like it would be fun just to see what they thought what their interpretation mm -hmm. of, of all this was but yes have you guys watched anything this week so i did yes oh god i watched winnie the pooh blood and honey too <laughs> how was that journey it was so much better than the first one really um it was fun this one i found to be fun i thought that the quality of the film both in terms of narratively as well as like budget wise it clearly had more of a budget was <laughs> yes. way more fun they leaned into the silly and stupidness of it um i thought that even though the plot is insane and they stole a lot of plot points from other movies. Um, <laughs> I just had a much better time watching this one, a way better time watching this one than I did the first one. Th I'm still giving it like one and a half, two stars out of five. Don't get me wrong. Like this is not like, it's not like it all of a sudden is a five star movie, but like yeah. it's better than like a, one, a, a half a star, you know what I like? Um, but uh, yeah, I had a great time. I, I really did. I, it, it, it was it was so much better i and 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 i appreciated that nice well yeah. i definitely haven't seen jamie have you seen the first one no i'm okay, okay. yeah <laughs> i just want to okay. watch it just to say that i did but yeah we'll yeah see. <laughs> i mean here's the thing you don't have to watch the first one to understand the second one Fair, because they, yes. they they actually like do a mini recap at the beginning all you like need to know is that like at the start of the second one, people think that Christopher Robin is insane. We are thinking he made up those things and people blame him for the murders in the first one. Got and it. that's all you really need to know. But um you you I think you should still watch the first one because it's fucking <clears throat> terrible and nuts. Yeah. Okay. I'll yeah. put it. But the on second one's much list. better. The second one's yes. much better. Fantastic. Love it. Okay, well, let's get into Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. We need a plot summary from producer Brian. Produce okay. Brian. Yes. No. Two minute plot summary. What's the plot? <laughs> I can do that. Yes, you got it. <laughs> Two minutes. Yes. All right. I'm ready. So, producer Brian, you have two minutes on the clock to tell us everything about bodies times three <laughs> okay tell okay. me when ready steady go okay so a group of like gen z's are getting together for a hurricane party there's a hurricane coming so they all go to their friend's mansion house sophie and her new girlfriend b show up but she's been kind of excommunicated from the group for a while self-imposed uh from the group i, I want to make sure that we all know these are all very wealthy like extremely wealthy teens or, or young adults, um, except for B, who's our point of view into all of this. None of them are expecting Sophie to show up. We later learned that Sophie had to go to rehab and Sophie has stayed away from them because she doesn't, she's there, she, they're toxic, they trigger her. Anyway, they're all at this party. It's all of her friends. It's Pete Davidson's dad's house. Um, and so long story short, um, the hurricane comes and you know there's something off about everything they all kind of like bicker a little bit they're all kind of like backhanded compliments at each other all that kind of stuff and then they find pete davidson dead outside and his throat has been slashed and they think that one of them did it meanwhile they've been playing the game bodies 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 trying to figure out who the murderer is like in the game um and then it actually starts happening in real life so um they uh they first uh blame the new person to the group, the older guy, Greg, who's dating Alice, uh, and they blood and B bludgeons him to death because they think he did it. But then they realize he didn't do it. And then they kind of start accusing each other. One of their other friends dies by falling, by being pushed down the stairs. Another one died. They have this amazing scene where they're all bickering and fighting with each other. One of them shoots the other one. Um, and then B doesn't trust her girlfriend, Sophie. Um, someone else falls, uh, is pushed off the stairs in the balcony. Anyway, they're all dead. Sophie and um, 
Sophie and B are there. They're fighting, and they find Pete Davidson's cell phone. They see that he was making a TikTok and accidentally slit his throat. And so this whole thing was just because, like, he accidentally killed himself, and they all kind of drove themselves insane to murder. Uh, and that's bodies, bodies, bodies in a nutshell. And that's the plot. <laughs> yes. And, like, this is another example of a movie where, like, Actually, a lot happens, but it's so much more character work than like individual mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. plot points and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's uh, bodies, bodies, bodies. Those yeah, bodies. and what a wild ride it was. So let's get into our first segment of likes and gripes. And now our likes and gripes. So this is all of our second time, at least, uh, watching this because we had all watched this before. I think we were planning on doing an episode, but then like got some things changed up in our schedule. Yeah. Um. So, Jamie, I'll let you go first, but I'm assuming you did another full rewatch uh, of this. Mm-hmm. So let us hear your likes and gripes about this. Yes. So we did a full rewatch. So second time watch. Um. And I definitely think this is a really fun rewatch. Like, it's very rewatchable, mm. but from a very different perspective. So, like, the yeah. first time you're watching this movie, it's very much a whodunit type of, like, murder mystery horror vibe. Obviously, also with, like, the the Gen Z element thrown into it. Um, mm-hmm. So, I think there's a lot of tension just around, like, who is the killer? Like, Which one of them actually did do this? Mm -hmm. Um, And it's set up where you're, at least for me, my experience was like spending a lot of time trying to figure out like, all right, like who is untrustworthy? Like what are the clues? Things like that. Um, To which like the ending like really surprised me upon first watch. Um, This time around, I paid way more attention to just like their overall relationship dynamics, Mm -hmm. which are wild (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah and there is a part of me that's like like i think it's a good rewatch but it's a hard rewatch because i brian made the connection of like this feels like the tv show girls but just the gen z version girls Mm. is like millennials Mm -hmm. to a t which that show was very hard for me to watch because I myself am a a millennial and when I was 20 something everything about being a 20 something year old (laughs) at that time was stressful and overwhelming I can't watch these people go through these experiences I know all of these people I hate Mm -hmm. all of these people Mm -hmm. it's deeply stressful Um, so like with the focus on that piece this time around I was like oh this movie is stressing me out again but for an entirely different reason last time i was stressed because i was scared this time i'm stressed because these characters are like overwhelming and like all just grating on each other and yeah. it's hard to like witness this mm-hmm. um so a good rewatch maybe i need some time before i watch it a third time mm-hmm. uh some space um but that being said like it's a it's a really excellent movie um it's a very good time. I have some like thoughts about like who, uh, cause I can't remember if we had ever looked up like, or talked about who made this movie. Like, is it made by millennials or is it made by Gen Z? Right. Um, and I think that's like a, an interesting like thing to, to talk about and reflect on. Um, but it very much feels like the focus is Gen Z. So, um, the director yes, of this film was born in 1975, and oh, wow. she is a uh, Gen X. I would, have, I believe that's where that. But falls. the screenplay is written by someone else, right? Mm-hmm. The screenplay is written by Sarah Delap, who wrote the amazing play Wolves about teenage girls that I think premiered off Broadway or at Lincoln Center at some point. Um, mm-hmm. She, however, was. Um, uh, I believe she was born in the 80s. I think she's um, around my age. Um, 
So she is definitely a millennial because what this movie feels like to me is a millennial's point of view on Gen Z. Mm-hmm. More than a Gen Z showing who they are. It mm-hmm. feels like the point of view, you know, a millennial's point of view of Gen Z in general, which I, I don't, that's not a bad thing. It's just an yeah. interesting thing to me. Um, born in 1990, it says. Okay. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's millennial. Age, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, um, and the the other person, um, the story, like the person who had the story idea, was born in nineteen eighty two. So so yeah, very much like all collectively created by millennials. <laughs> and Which it's interesting. In- in- oh, sorry, no go. No, well, I was gonna say I I think mm-hmm. it's interesting because we had a mini conversation about this in our last episode. Um, because we were talking about a millennial writing about the millennial child experience. And then now Mm -hmm. this, the millennials writing about uh, essentially a Gen Z experience. And with that idea in mind, it felt to me a little heavy handed on what that perspective of Gen Z was just with the little quips of like, Oh, I should have recorded that. Or, you know, all of the drugs and like, all of the TikTok, which I know is something that is we're all doing, and of course mm-hmm. is utilized more that social media platform is utilized more, yeah, for Gen Z. But just some of the little things that they said, it just felt like I mean, you didn't have to say that, like, it, you're really just making right. holding it in, like, this is these are Gen Z people, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but yeah, 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 no, no that's fair. I agree, yeah, um, <clears throat> and like, curious to explore because we've talked about other movies that resonated with us all of us being millennials that were were came out for other generations and like Mm. just that being interesting which i don't want to get too much into because it might spoil my suggestion so um (laughs) that being said uh this movie is deeply quotable as we started out talking about um it is like the cast is incredible um just like everybody everybody plays their part really really well which i think again like just speaks to the discomfort that it brings me um of like (laughs) how they're interacting with each other Mm -hmm. and uh yeah it's just like it's the I'll I'll get right to my point about like the thesis that I think this movie is. The reason why I made that like joke about, you know, if you're triggered by maintaining relationships that don't serve you, there's a line. I think it's Rachel Sennett's character where she talks about like the suffocating weight of our shared history. Yes. Like that's that's the that's the thesis of this. Um in my opinion is like <clears throat> the the, like there's a lot of other things that are at play and like why why these people should not be friends with each other anymore but it's mm-hmm. like <clears throat> time they've been friends for so long they've been through all these experiences some might say it's like trauma bonding but i, I as we've talked about i think that's like <laughs> a, a misinterpreted thing but i do think that like because they've all shared in all of these like intense experiences with one another and the time that they've been in each other's lives like you know sophie's been best friends with david for like ever their parents are friends and Mm -hmm. like they're calling each other best friends but like when she shows up at the house in the beginning he's like does not seem enthused yeah and (laughs) and like and and so like there's that um you know the fact that she's that sophie's dealt with addiction and that they have all had to like help her navigate that experience and like they talk specifically about anecdotes of like what that was like for them um so i think like all of that is is both like keeping them together keeping them like intertwined even if it's not healthy for any of them to probably maintain any contact with one another Mm -hmm. and i think that's like a very real which is why it's so stressful (laughs) a very real experience of like you know 
when you invest so much energy into a person or a group of people, it's so much harder to imagine yourself like no longer being connected to them, even if they're not like a good person for you. It's like, well, I can't just like leave this person behind. They were, they were there for me for all of these times. And it's like, sure. But also like who you were back then is not who you are now. And Mm -hmm. do you need to keep them in your life just because of all of those past experiences? If they are not being a good friend to you now in the way that you need Mm -hmm. them to be. Like Mm -hmm. people grow apart. And I think we need to normalize that like, it's okay that certain friendships don't maintain forever, especially ones that are like really rooted in this like toxicity where this Mm -hmm. is not helping anyone. (laughs) And it's like, are they, are they all actually awful or are they just awful with each other? Like, are they just all not good with each other And like a need to split up and go on their separate ways. And then maybe like that will serve them more effectively. I think it could, I think it's probably both. (laughs) I mean, yeah, because they're harboring such resentment for each other. It's like, how are y'all even having any kind of pleasant conversation with each other in this moment? Because everything seems to keep coming to a head, but you continue moving forward. And why, you know, Mm -hmm. it's just so funny. It reminds me of friends that I've had who have asked longtime uh, friends to be in their weddings when mm. they don't like really talk to them anymore, but just because sure. they've known them for a long time. Yeah. So that's a, such an interesting concept to me. I can absolutely understand um, um, falling into that, mm-hmm. but I, just seeing it on screen like that, it's like, how could you ever just let people in yeah. your life, like stay in your life like that? Yeah. Like it's not, it's not, good no. <laughs> but I, th- I think also there's the um uh oh my god what is it called the the um there's a fr- now i'm not gonna remember the phrase of course but like the idea of like oh sunken time like time sunk sunk cost fallacy there we go i got there eventually where it's like yes. <clears throat> the more time you invest in a relationship the harder it is to walk away because you're you're the amount of time is like the justification to continue it So it's like, I can't just stop being friends with this person because I've been friends with them for so long. I can't end this relationship because I've been with this person for so long. And it's like, Mm -hmm. yes, you can. Like, there's this, there's like this anxiety about time and like, oh, I have to like start over or like I, because I've spent so much time with this person, like, what does this mean if I'm, if they're not in my life anymore? And like, there's so much of that that keeps us stuck in things that like aren't necessarily serving us. And it's Mm -hmm. all it's all made up essentially. Like we are imposing these things on ourselves. We can walk away from these people. One of the like things that really set me free in terms of friendships that like didn't serve me was like recognizing a really unhealthy friendship dynamic and, and deciding that like enough was enough. And I needed to end that relationship, even if Mm. other people like maintained that friendship, because like it just does, it didn't work for me anymore. And it was, so much labor on my end to like try to accommodate this person and like do all of this stuff. And then finally I was like, why am I doing this? Like, it's only making me feel like shit. All aspects of this friendship make me feel like shit, whether I'm catering to this person or not catering to this person. Mm -hmm. Why am I doing this? And like, that was like this like big epiphany light bulb moment for me. And it happened in grad school. And I was like, thank God that I like learn that lesson at that point in my life because like from then on it really served me and just like thinking and not like a selfish way but more of like yeah. you know like relationships are reciprocal like you put in something and you get what you need in return and like that there's this mutual support and like love and compassion for one another but like when it becomes really this like unhealthy power dynamic and like really mm-hmm. unhealthy like why why are we doing this like to what end so Do that that end? was yes yeah, that was that was a lesson that I learned, and I would love all of these characters to learn it as well. Um, and that has been but, part of the uh, talk about healthy <laughs> friendships <laughs> with yeah, Jamie. A necessary parlor talk, but a parlor Absolutely. talk nonetheless. nonetheless. Yes. Come sit, have a drink. It's parlor talk. <laughs> uh, in terms of again the original watch. Uh, I really liked all of the deaths. It was like, it was all very clever. And because they were all like slightly different with the exception of B killing Greg, um, that like just kind of fueling this like 
what like what's really going on like right crimes of opportunity or like what like what the hell is is happening and then to just realize that like they were all just like so fuck like wasted and fucked up and like most of them were truly a result of that um like just ultimately blew my mind and and again really just speaks to like their relationship dynamics being so fragile that they were mm-hmm. so quick to turn on each other be- despite all of these like ridiculous accidents and like all the drugs that were also involved that it's mm-hmm. like priming right. them to just like <laughs> be pieces of shit to each other. Um, yes. So, uh, well, I guess also, yeah. Th- then when Jordan has the gun and shoots out, <laughs> which God. the second one is an accident, but the first one I'm just like, Holy shit. Like, wild. Um, Jordan was just ready to go off the deep end. It was great. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and that's another thing is, like, so second time, first time watch, Jordan, like, is kind of, like, scrutinizing B. And I didn't think a lot about it the first time around because I think it was just, like, a, oh, here's, like, the new person infiltrating our group. Mm-hmm. And, like, Jordan being this really protective friend. This time around, knowing how all of the shit unfolds at the end of the movie, mm-hmm. I'm very much looking at Jordan as like, oh, like, there's definitely something going on with Sophie. She's deeply jealous of B's presence there and is doing anything she can to interfere. Like, I didn't, I was not paying, like, my perception of, like, how she was interacting with B had, like, fundamentally changed between the first time watch and the second time watch. And, and, like, that really surprised me because, like, I just – I didn't remember her being so, like, like just poking at B constantly in that way and not just mm-hmm. in, like, a, like, I'm protecting my friends. Like, who the fuck are you? But more so of, like, a, like, you're – you're with the person that like I want to be with kind of thing. And like, I am not okay with this. Mm -hmm. Um, So that, that was like a really interesting um, thing that I noticed a lot in this watch as well. Um, The other thing that I thought was really interesting is like the music is really time specific. So like, and and I know that they do reference TikTok, but more specifically Mm -hmm. when when the board in the house and I'm in the house board comes on in the beginning and they're recording themselves dancing, like that is like such a specific time period on TikTok meme of like lockdown time. Yes. And like mm-hmm. when like early stages of, of not early stages of TikTok, but early stages of like I think as TikTok was like slowly becoming like the the big social media thing that it has mm-hmm. since become, or at least like that was when Gen Z had dominated TikTok and then millennials yes. got on board later and like, f- like, you know, have, have a huge presence on it as well. Um, mm-hmm. But like that, that like sound clip, like totally put me at a very specific time. And like, even that felt like very Gen Z. It like, I, I think mm. like, just like the, the dancing, like so mm-hmm. much, like early TikTok was like all these dance, like chore- choreography and things like that. Um, it reminded me of when uh, Brian and I and friends went away to the Catskills and we once uh, were in diving <laughs> beverages and tried mm-hmm. to do a dance that we had seen on TikTok. Um, oh, and it amazing. went really poorly. No one died. <laughs> but no one died. No and one died. Well, we didn't play this game. We weren't having a hurricane party. <laughs> Oh, also uh, something I want to point out. <laughs> um, I really love that they call the game bodies, 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 but Greg calls it werewolf. Yes. Like mm-hmm. that's just like to me, that's when you like <clears throat> the screenwriter is a true professional, like real you could tell this person's like a theater person, one that used Hedda Gabbler. But two, <clears throat> like but also Hedda Gabbler is a, is foreshadowing of the end of this movie. And I'm so mad that I didn't pick it up the first time because in Hedda Gadler, her husband kills herself, but everyone is like denying that in there. And she's this narcissistic woman who's been built by men. And like, she's kind of like manipulating everybody and trying to get her way. And it ends in a bad way for her. But like, it's a, it's very indicative of kind of what's happening here as well as a twist at the end that he kills himself by accident Mm. or, you know, and, and, um, 
Uh, I just I just think this screenplay is is perfect. I think it works so well. It's so tight and it never hits you over the head with like with plot points like moving yeah. forward. There's so much subtext in the first half of this movie that doesn't feel like red herrings and it but it mm-hmm. all still comes back in the end. Like Pete Davidson being jealous of him cutting the the bottle open mm-hmm. with the machete. Mm-hmm. You think it's just him like like even though you could see the jealousy in it and whatnot, all subtext. Um, the subtext of like her saying, Oh, I'm sober now. And everyone's like, yay. Like there's so <laughs> much incredible subtext in this. And then like Max, all the story of Max hitting on her and him not mm-hmm. feeling manly enough. And we just see his insecurities. Mm-hmm. Like even when he's in his conversation with Sophie. And then once we know Sophie's, um, real motive to get them to talk to her parents to get her her trust back like Mm -hmm. there's just oh man this movie it's just so good and that all comes back in that pivotal scene in the middle at the end of the movie with all the girls like just like like telling it like it is in this very intense situation like the murder in this movie a movie like this the murder aspect of this movie is spectacular because it raises the stakes like having this conversation without the stakes of the murder feels like a girl's episode. This makes it feel like more important, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <sighs> I agree. That's why I couldn't finish Girls. <laughs> I love Girls. I love Girls. I never watched it, but I've just seen clips about it and just like mm-hmm. the different types of, of characters. Because what Allison Williams. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is is in it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. She's amazing on the show. That character Amazingly is so awful. fucking real. All of these characters, yeah. they're all real. That's, all that That's why yeah. I can't watch this show. Ugh. It's okay. all like it feels like they just knew random people that I knew and then turned oh. them into a TV show. And it's like that's why it's Ugh. so hard to watch because in it comparison, feels very real. <laughs> in comparison to like Sex in the City, because watching it now, it's like all of them are kind of awful in their own way, except for Samantha. I will ride or die for Samantha. I've, actually, I've never watched Sex in the City. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like that's a that's a really interesting like comparison because I feel like that's also something that like our generation grew up with, but like mm-hmm. from a much younger age. Exactly. And so like kind of looking up to like this group of of people that it's like are we aspiring to be like them? Like what's, what's the, you know, what is right. drawing us to this group of women who are like living their best lives and like being free and somehow affording right. these like insane apartments. Um, in, in New, New York. York. Like I don't, I will never understand that except for Miranda. Cause she was a lawyer. So I'm like, okay, great. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> yes. That just reminds me of just like the dynamic of a, girl friendship group and just seeing kind of like the different ways in which like oh this might be a little bit toxic especially Mm -hmm. because in all in relation to this there is one episode where carrie is like i don't need a therapist i have you guys no (laughs) ma'am no absolutely not shut it down immediately well i think that that's another big conversation that a lot of these shows portray this, these groups of friends who like get together for coffee, whether it's how I met your mother and they go to the bar or the golden mm-hmm. girls and they sit and eat cheesecake. Like that's their therapy session. Mm-hmm. But like, and like, if you have a good group of friends that you can talk about stuff with and like, you're good. Like, I think a lot of them set poor expectations for certain generations of like what talking about your feelings actually should be like. And, mm-hmm. you know, I feel like millennials and younger have, have really done an excellent job of kind of breaking out of uh, what society or what media tells us is an appropriate way to kind of like feel like you're getting the help you need. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> Agree. Yeah. In conclusion, go to therapy. Go to therapy. But also, like, you can also talk to your friends. Yeah. You can do both. But a therapist is going to be unbiased, whereas your friends are going to be biased. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, like, a big difference to keep in mind when you're looking for support. Totally. Yes. And it's also nice Um, to ask the new the new thing speaking to brian talking about like how we're trying to change the dynamic of things is like making sure your friends are ready to receive what you're you know going to vent to them yeah Yeah. sure and and just being like are you even in a space to hear what i have to say right now and being Mm -hmm. okay if they say no maybe they're not in a headspace to listen to your issues right now i think that's such a great way to kind of like keep everything together 
a million bajillion percent. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, I think that there's, and and I, I think that also like, it, it makes me think about therapy speak and social media and, and we'll probably talk about like certain language that's used in this movie in particular mm-hmm. too. But like, I think boundaries has become like a really big hot topic um, mm. for people now for a variety of reasons. But I think that I, I've seen some things that like make me question like where are people learning about this stuff from? And I'm worried that most of it is on TikTok and that makes yes. me scared <laughs> and mad at the same time. Mm, but like, sure it is. I think that I think that it is like okay to check in with a friend and be like, hey, like I'm dealing with like some heavy stuff right now. Like, do you have space for me right now? Or like if you're busy, can you let me know when you might have space? Um, mm-hmm. just to give somebody a heads up before you like potentially unload a bunch of stuff. Especially if you're looking for support right in that moment. Because like what if they're what if they're at work and like they they really don't have that time that in time, that moment. Yep. And that doesn't mm-hmm. mean that they don't care about you. Right. Sure. And so like, it's also about like figuring out how, when and how you're going to get the support that you're looking for in any given moment. Um, but it, I think that like people have gone like in a variety of directions when it comes to boundaries and I will always boundaries will be my forever topic. Mm-hmm. Um, because I just think that it's like, going it's just a part of like living and being a person forever and ever and this is ending up to be just like parlor talk jamie parlor talk it's all good but (laughs) but um the the things about like there's there seems to be like weird conversations happening around like boundaries and like like friends breaking up over like boundary dynamics that it doesn't seem like it's actually about like setting boundaries or like being some people have a really hard time receiving a boundary and then like that has Mm. ended friendships Mm -hmm. which i think says more about like maybe there were other issues at play Mm -hmm. but i feel like the plot has been lost because of that in some ways and it's like now people are feeling like they have to just open themselves up a hundred percent of the time and it's like no Mm. we can we find like what's the in between of these things like you don't have to be wholly available to somebody to be a supportive compassionate friend but also like if you're super closed off it's going to be really hard potentially for you to connect with people so like right where is there space in the middle for you to make that work and also hopefully the people that you are surrounding yourself with feel similarly or which at is least you're on the same page mm-hmm. and like managing expectations Right, which is like what is happening with Sophie because they say that she just kind of like goes away. So your point of like her closing off everything and then trying yeah. to come back and then have everything be okay. It's like the extremes mm-hmm. of the matter. As I yeah. mean, there's more in that relationship to deal with than just that. But just one example right. of that, it's like the extremes of it all. Like yeah. How can we come to come together in this and not just you completely go this way and I go this way and then we try to come together again and act like nothing ever happened. Yeah, like just to kind of shove it under the rug. Because Sophie's yeah. pretty honest to halfway through the movie when she's like, you know, being around you is triggering. It's toxic for me. I'm mm-hmm. not saying she's handling it in the right way in terms of like cold turkey with her friends. But I think that was interesting. And then once they, the only reason she's there is for selfish reasons to get her trust trust, (laughs) but also she brings b mostly to like piss off a lot of the people at that party Mm -hmm. so like there's a lot of like you know and and i think that like I, i think that the change in the characters in this is like you know the movie opens with them making out and like saying i love you and b can't say it back Mm-hmm. And it, and you'd think a movie like this would end with like B realizing that like Sophie's the one and says like I love you too, but right. she says you frighten me. So like <laughs> the change is that she can be honest and realize like what the fuck am I like? I have real people problems, which is my mm-hmm. mom is sick and I have to take yes. care of her, mm-hmm. and these people have like v- v- champagne, like very different types of problems. Well, not to mention like her socioeconomic like status and class yeah 100 like, mm-hmm. percent. like these people are like on a whole nother level mm-hmm. and they even get into it i think with jordan too where they talk about how like 
D- don't just, they say that her she's upper middle class? Yep. Uh huh. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, like, like, your parents work at a university, and she's like, "It's public." Yeah, yeah. perfect. Or like, or what they say? They say like, "You see this house? Like, Sophie's parents are rich, 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 rich." Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, I thought that was all really interesting. Um, yeah, the way that the, the way that information is uh, revealed and released naturally in conversations yeah. in this Absolutely. movie. Absolutely, nothing feels like exposition in this movie, mm-hmm. and that's yeah. why it's really great. Mm-hmm. like to me that puts it over the top because nothing feels like it's for the audience everything g- organically feels like it's for b yeah and i think that is that that what a hard thing to do mm. on all sides okay. writing it and executing it yeah like totally yeah. yeah like the script is great and the actors are even better if that's even right. possible yeah. right yeah just the execution again yeah. Shout out to Rachel Sennett for like Ugh. she's got Fucking she's got hilarious. some lines she's oh got gosh. some whole scenes oh, that like good. she's so oh god you you like know this person yeah oh, just man. going it's back and so forth ping ponging to everyone like mm. oh and I I'm with you now and I agree with you or oh I'm with you and I agree with you it's crazy mm-hmm. yeah it. her so her weird. lines are are truly exceptional um, yes. But uh, yeah, I don't have a lot of gripes with this movie, with the exception of like, I think the their dealings around mental health stuff and like using that language is sure. problematic. But I do think that it's reflective of like a reality that we're seeing now of people throwing a lot of these like terms out and not necessarily like coming from an informed place. Um, mm-hmm. which just like furthers the confusion about like what is what is anybody talking about anymore um truly so uh so yeah yes. stop going on tiktok to learn about mental health great lesson learned i mean let's, there's there's so many i i can't uh i want to piggyback off of some of the things that that jamie said uh in listening to you talk about this it made me think my likes and gripes when I was writing them down were from the perspective of watching this a second time and not necessarily how I felt when I watched it the first time. Totally. Mm -hmm. Um, And I will say for me, it wasn't as fun a second time to watch this. Oh, interesting. And I think it was just because I was wanting to get to the end again because I just really loved the ending and I, I loved how everything came together. And it, this is, it, it's not a huge, huge gripe. I mean, like on a scale of one to 10, this is a two of a gripe. Uh, but I just had a, a little bit of a hard time watching it the, the second go around. But when I first watched this, it was in the movie theater. I absolutely love everything about it. I still agree about the acting. I still agree about the script is great. One of my um, things was, is this, what what was improv improvised i want to know how much of this was improvised Mm. especially with pete davison's character um because everything like we had said flowed so naturally Mm -hmm. that a lot of the conversations i'm like okay how much was this actually in the script and how much did they make up because all this is just fucking hilarious and and so organic and and i love it um Hurricane parties, absolutely. Don't knock it till you try it. I have had them a lot when I was in college. I was like, absolutely, yes, I remember this. And it was, you know, not necessarily to the extent of all of this drama and drugs, but it was still a fun time to, you know, be out in in the rain Mm -hmm. and not really be like a, you know, super bad hurricane. So fun times uh, with that. Um, I, what did I put? I don't know. I have no oh my god (laughs) sometimes I just like write shit down and like Mm -hmm. this is how my brain works and then I'm like what the hell was I trying to say with this Mm -hmm. um anyway I'm skipping over that I love bringing back the over sexualized teens in horror movies like (laughs) always a vibe but in a real believable way yeah absolutely yeah it's not like to the extreme but i just always am appreciative of just that trope in general mm-hmm. it's like teens are going to be teens and so here we are like um yeah. i love the tension we've already talked about the tension with everyone with sophie and just how that all plays out um i like how the title of the movie is the actual title of the game that they're playing mm-hmm. um poor greg because he was just trying to live his life and then he was just a vet 
He was just oh he was just a that vet. reveal is so that makes me so sad. Oh. Mm-hmm. Everything God. with Greg is amazing. I I mean, also No, go ahead. I also like that for most of the movie when B kills him, like she's the only actual murderer until Jordan does her thing by accident. <laughs> Absolutely. But I like yeah. that B's the only one who does that. And I, I also Story wise, I love that uh, Sophie just never fucking sticks up for her in any situation. No, not at all. Spe- especially when they throw her outside. Yeah, she's just like, yeah. okay, yeah, just because whatever. I can't, I can't trust you. Mm-hmm. As watching it a second time, I was like, Sophie, you're actually also trash. So this is like, not well, fun. that's <laughs> but Nikisha to support your first one. Mm-hmm. Your comment about watching it the first time. I think what's exciting about the first time watching it, and Jamie mentioned this too, is watching these characters actually reveal their true natures. Mm. The second time through, you know their true natures, so there's a level of subtext that you cannot get the first time. And yeah. I think that, I think like that's what makes a first watch and a rewatch really interesting. And I think whether you enjoy the first one or the second better is completely person dependent. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I can totally agree with that. Mm-hmm. Just knowing what their in, everyone's in game is and then how they're playing that throughout is, is really cool. Also, um, when you were just mentioning B, I put B as a gangster with a capital G and I'm absolutely <laughs> obsessed with it because she was like, listen, y'all are all talk. I'm about to handle this because yeah. self-defense. She said I was it was self-defense. Um, um, the line that Pete Davidson has about her, she's kind of cute in a school shooter kind of way. Yes. Oh, my God. Uh, Amazing. Uh, just, I can't. So, so good. Or um, what was it? This has weed in it. Just want to let you know. the ca- When she's like scarfing oh down the God. cake. Yes. I mean, that cake looked delicious. <laughs> but also, because of her socioeconomic standing, she's probably, and she doesn't have that job. She's hanging out in the food court just to like put on... Um, you know, uh, appearances. She dropped out of college, all of that. She probably doesn't eat a lot. She's at this house with a cake. And like, mm. it's like when you, like in those old timey movies when like you bring an orphan to like, you know, like, oh, they, they just like <laughs> yes. eat up all the food. Like it, it had yes. that vibe to it. You know what I mean? <laughs> it did. Cause she was just like living, living her own life and trying yeah. to, to fit in with these people. Yeah. Dr. Zhivago is my favorite and... film. Oh my God. Oh my god! This movie, uh, every line makes me. I, I, this is this is a great horror comedy. Absolutely. Um, the, we already said the podcast line, and that was my favorite line in the whole movie. It's fucking hilarious. Um, I, Jordan and Sophie's back and forth when Jordan had the gun in her hand also was my favorite scene then and my favorite scene now. Mm-hmm. Just how they're bringing up all of their things, and you can see this go around kind of Sophie's demeanor change into yeah. like playing more of the victim in everything that has been happening. And um, really just trying to, like Jamie was saying, spew out, you know, those, those words of like, you guys are triggering me and all, all these things. Um, but I will say with that caliber of a gun, Alice would have fallen to the ground being shot. Are you kidding me? She's still standing there. It's like, what is going on? <laughs> Um, also, but, one of my gripes is like that gun had a lot of bullets in it. Uh, <laughs> yes, because at the end they're still holding it like I and, and they keep bullets in this. Yeah, yeah, like when they're upstairs and like the the gun keeps going off. I'm like, there's no yes. way that there is 15 bullets in this gun right now. <clears throat> Absolutely not. No. no. Um, but yeah, I I definitely still enjoy everything about this movie. It's well acted. It's funny. Uh, it's a great concept, um, but yeah, just the second go around, I was just a little, a little bit, tiniest bit, just ready to get to the end and get to everything. But mm-hmm. other than that, it's still a great watch, it's still a great movie. Um, and yeah, that's really, yeah, that's really all I had about it. Brian, I'm gonna start with my gripes because I don't want to, because I really like this movie, so I don't want to like end on the poopy note. Um, yes. I hate when characters say, no, listen, I can explain. Just tell them you dropped out of college. You don't, you know what I mean? Like, like that felt, I hated that. That didn't feel real. If if someone was like, if people were like ganging up on me, I wouldn't be like, wait, let me explain. I would literally be like, I dropped out of college. Like I would just Just like tell them, stop them. Like it didn't feel like a realistic tactic and and, like to Mm -hmm. stop people from getting on your shit. Um, Lots of bullets in the gun. I understand 
that at the end of the movie when she throws her phone, she's just trying to distract her and she doesn't want her fo- but I'm like why don't you throw the phone in the pool? Like just throw the phone in the pool. You can buy a new one. Yes. But but I I get why she's doing that. Um the one thing about the movie that I think is a total leap is I don't believe that B and Sophie at the end would stop everything to unlock Pete Davidson's phone. Yeah. Mm. Like finding it in the mud and thinking that it's Sophie's totally makes sense. But for them, like during this really heightened intensity of like, are you cheating on me? Did I just go through this night to defend the bees? Like kill the person, defend you. And then they find Pete Davidson's cell phone and they're like, Oh, maybe we should go through it and see what happened. Like, like that moment makes sense that they would want to do that. I don't think that that moment in the movie is massaged enough to make me believe that they would stop what they were doing and start a new emotional beat. Mm, fair. Yes. <laughs> um, so those are my, this, but the payoff with like them opening his eyes and like doing the scan of the phone mm-hmm. face and like opening it and seeing the video, like that's all incredible. I just think the moment getting there needed to be more smoothed out. Maybe earlier in the movie, they were looking for his phone to see what had happened. I forget if they did. If they, but I just think there could have been another little thing here or there to to make that moment work a little bit better. Mm. But in every, I agree with all the things that you two said. Um, mm. I really like the opening of this movie because in other movies, them making out would make you as an audience member feel like a fly on the wall. But mm. to me, Sophie feels deeply performative. Like, mm. Sophie, it doesn't feel like an intimate moment. It feels like a, a a stage moment where, like, she's putting on a show for us, the audience, f- but mostly for B. Um, and I like that. I think that introduces the character well. Something that I don't know if I picked up the first time, but definitely picked up the second time. Um, just because now I know the Sophie character a bit better. Yeah. Um and I really like that supposedly intimate moment cutting to them texting each other next, like texting next to each other in the car. Mm-hmm. Like I thought that was just, I thought it was great. I love the girls uh, group chat conversation. Like, you know, I'm not good with that. With And like lying about putting in the group chat. Like that was, yeah. that was fantastic. Um, all the foreshadowing with the bottle, as I mentioned, was great. Um, everything Sophie does in this movie feels performative until like the heightened emotion at the end. Um, it feels like something that I think is very cool about this scripted movie is all of their behavior feels learned. All of these characters behavior feels like they got it from gossip girl or they got it from pretty little liars or they got it from their parents. None of their behaviors feels organic in the best way possible. Like yeah. for the characters, like I, you, you can you can see what their parents are like through the these these characters, and I think that is just like um, um, amazing. Um, and the set decoration too; they had already been there for like a day, a day and a half. You can see like there's always like wine glasses that have been fully drunk on the table from what they were doing the night before. Like I just thought the set decoration was really mm. really good. Um, the kissing and biting sequence in terms of like kiss or kill moments that kind of foreshadowed this this group like dynamic was really good um i just think lee pace's greg is like amazing in this movie he's um, so good he's I feel so like he's good super underrated but like i feel like everything he's in he just like really delivered. so Maybe good he's not underrated, i, don't I mean know, i saw him in I angels just... in america on broadway and he was amazing <laughs> oh fantastic um man i love lee pace yeah i mean uh, uh, <laughs> pushing daisies Oh, I loved Pushing Daisies. Yeah. So good. Um, the gaslighting conversation where he's actually gaslighting her while explaining gaslighting is like fucking incredible. I also like the meta of this movie where you could watch this movie and not know who Pete Davidson is at all and like think that the char- like the character comes across exactly how it's supposed to come across. But then there's also he's got that line where it's like, I look like I fuck. Like, you know, like, like yes. it would have that meta humor to it as well. But you don't need yes. that to like, I thought that's, I think that's really well cast just in general. Um, Oh my God. When B pukes a little bit. <gasps> oh. Amazing. Just like the perfect. Um, yes. Man, the conspiracy of all these characters have in their head. Plus like, but it's all feels logical at the same time. Just really well done. Um, 
Yeah, I just think this movie is great. I really think this movie is great. And here are some of the quotes that I pulled from it as well that yeah. I haven't mentioned yet. Um, we're drowning in your feelings. Mm-hmm. <laughs> great line. Oh. Um, I said this already, but I love it. Uh, I have body dysmorphia. Oh, shut the fuck up, Alice. Oh so my God, good. Yes. We've known each other forever. He's a Libra moon. That says a lot. Oh, when when they're when they are confronting Alice about what she oh knows, like God. what's his what last name? Know? What's his middle name? Yeah, I didn't ask his middle name. It's like I know that he's a Libra room, uh, a Libra moon. Libra moon, yes. <laughs> that, that says, says a lot. A lot. Um, <laughs> and they already told, or or someone already mentions that they like met on Tinder. I mean, I think Pete Davidson's character, like, yeah, says, mm-hmm. like, yeah. So how are you gonna know oh, about this guy? <laughs> great, so so good. <laughs> It's so good. I also love the every time they kept talking about Emma and Hedda Gabler, and then eventually one of the girls, I forgot who, but she was just like, she wasn't that good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. So she was an actress. She was in Hedda Gabler. She's like, she wasn't that good. In- yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I bet that was an awful production of Hedda Gabler. Oh, uh, I can't even imagine. But also, it's just, it is uh, what we talked about, just seeing people you know in all of this like the person mm-hmm. who in any situation like will cry or just the foreshadowing of being like every time i put this emma cries and now here she is crying mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Know, this is great. oh so good i love it anything else we would like to mention about this i don't think so yeah oh i would watch a sequel to this about a trial where you mm. flash back to like <laughs> Like it's it's like this like character assassination trial while they're doing everything, and it all flashes back to like moments they had, so you can get the girls back into it. And like it's like yes. I I would watch that. I, I don't need it. I this is a standalone film that's fantastic, but mm-hmm. um, and and uh, but I would love that because realistically, B would take the fall because she is the new person, and 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 the other because they're rich kids. Um, mm-hmm. you know, um, I think that you know they would most likely get off and stuff like that. But anyway, absolutely, because also she's kind of the only one who we see technically kill two people. Like right. she killed mm-hmm. Greg and she killed she knocked Jordan off that uh mm-hmm. that ledge, that balcony. So wild and crazy. Okay, well let's get into our next segment: brains. <laughs> Tasty. Mm-hmm. So, Jamie, my first question to you, and we talk about this word up and down, sideways, frontwards, backwards, Mm-mm. all the ways, mm-hmm. cartwheels, gaslighting. So, my question to you is Has the term gaslighting always been a term, or are we just now like hearing about it because of social media and because it's been thrown out there uh, so much? Of course, the actual act of gaslighting has been around for forever. But my question really is, it's just like, is this a new term that has been coined like within recent years? Um, no. Okay. The end. Um, uh, <laughs> the end. We're all just overhearing the word now. Yes. <laughs> um, I think we talked about this once before. Um, yeah, I think but you're right. It comes from a 1944 film called gaslight i it was a psychological thriller um with ingrid bergman uh and i think i i forget exactly what it's about but like that's what it's about and then i think that like in terms of it kind of becoming more popular um i mean i think that i i think that it's been like popularized in like a mental health and like psychological context like for Mm -hmm. the for like most of our lives but i think now it's just really grow like like it's just in the the general conversation way more and i think part Mm -hmm. of that is like hopefully I, i i want to think like normalizing therapy a little bit more and reducing stigma around therapy um and like i don't know if maybe like holding people accountable for their actions more has increased more awareness around this term um Mm. but uh but yeah i it's it's been around for a while but like definitely has um has ramped up significantly but i would say probably in like the 90s 
did it like really start to become more popularized in like mental health and and things like that and now it's like now t- now there's tiktok tiktoks next the the, the movie therapist. is that movie is based on a play from the 30s mm. um mm. but i think i think like the, the term was started to be used more around the movie when that got popular but mm-hmm. in the movie it, 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 so ga- gaslight in the movie and in the play like uh every time the husband goes like out the gas lights dim in the house. Yeah. Uh, and oh. and and that's because he's like doing mysterious weird stuff, which is like the mystery. Right. But he's lying to her and saying like, "Lo, the the lights aren't dimming. It's just your imagination." Yeah. So that's kind of where that comes from. Drink some brandy. It'll make you feel better. Yeah. Drink a brandy. It'll oh make you feel better. God. Oh man. <laughs> I love that vertigo. So it. good too. <laughs> that's another. That that's. Vertigo is one of the only movies that I can think of from that old where, like, it's being gaslit the other way. Mm. Mm. Never seen it. Oh. Mm. Anyway. Yeah. For another nice. another time. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay, fantastic. So I would like to know, Jamie, there's a lot of different responses to all of these very traumatic events on top of all of these emotional um things that each of these characters are are holding in so we talk about responses to trauma flight fight freeze fond and i would just like to know if what you think each character um response is mostly our favorite girl alice um emma who's the best at head of gobbler and sophie and jordan (laughs) and just what you think their responses are like based on this movie if they each like have one yeah i mean i think that i i think that it's hard to kind of assign all of them something because Mm -hmm. i i feel like perhaps not all of them are hit are like having that like adrenaline state Mm -hmm. at least that's my perception Yeah, yeah i feel like out of all of them, B really is the only one who is like constantly being put into a state of adrenaline because like uh. this whole dynamic is like you know deeply unsettling and new to her. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do think that she, I, I think she we see her in like fight a few times. Um, mm. And then I think a little bit of freezing. Um, She's walking around a lot, like, in a daze. But she also does kill Greg in, in, like, I think that is, like, fight or flight moment. Mm -hmm. um, Where she, like, sees him kind of, like, go up towards Sophie. And then she just reacts. Um, Yeah. And I don't think she's, like, fully thinking about it. Because I do think that. I don't think that the rest of them are necessarily in that state because I think that they still are like cognizant enough of what's going on. Mm, okay. Um, like, because I think, I mean, we see Jordan <laughs> shoot Alice on purpose. Yes. Um, and then really like the accidental shooting is just like all of them fighting over the gun. And right. I don't think that right. is speaking to any of those states. I think Sophie is like Sophie probably is more I was about to say like maybe some (laughs) like sociopathic behaviors going on there but like yeah talk about it uh, well because I just think that she is like deeply deeply manipulative (laughs) yes big time (laughs) and like I I don't think that there's a moment where she's really not in control not to say that she's not like scared about what's happening Mm -hmm. but i i just think that like she really doesn't fully let her guard down and like again re-watching this movie even like from her saying i love you to like this whole movie i think that we're seeing her just like do what she needs to do in order to get what she wants from other people and so yeah. I don't really think that she is in a state, and I could be wrong because again, it's like 
hard to know when someone like goes into that kind of crisis mode but like that wasn't the vibe that I got from her um I think what well, maybe Emma um I think that she like flees when she first finds Pete Davidson dead and like mm-hmm. runs into the room and like hides under the covers mm-hmm. and it's just kind of like in a daze I think that's probably the other character that's like not really like doing fully processing what's yeah, going yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. because then then there's that weird moment between her and Sophie and she like there's like a misreading of a situation yes and she already seems like very inebriated and then Sophie's like do you want these drugs and she's like sure and it's like very weird um mm-hmm. and disconcerting and then and then she trips and falls down the stairs yeah such a wild ride that whole uh yeah. scene was yeah. of just like coming out of like into consciousness in the bed of like what are y'all doing because she's literally just like what are y'all doing where am i what's happening in this situation mm-hmm. because of all mm-hmm. that which also is a yeah. good point to think about the response as being something that's not um conscious uh which is something that i was not thinking about in this it's like no this is just like what you do when a traumatic situation happens not necessarily like this is truly what you do when you're not conscious and this is just your actual like reaction to to this not necessarily thinking about it um yeah that makes sense yeah i think it's important to like remind people of that because i think yes people feel badly sometimes about how they're reacting to things but like if you think about it from the perspective of like our bodies are like biologically like trying to keep us safe in moments of danger um Mm -hmm. and like that then are we are responding and it's like we're not like thinking like okay this person's like climb into my house i'm gonna do xyz it's like no when brian comes up the stairs and i forget that like we live together i like fully (laughs) freeze in my kitchen and it's like no i don't know why this happens to me so often i know you live here i know you're home like how do you scare me um Mm -hmm. happens way too often and then i get really mad at myself of like man if you were like a killer like i would be murdered right now and like that's so upsetting Mm -hmm. but it's like i have no control over how i'm responding in that moment that's just like literally how my body has decided this is how you this is your best chance for survival yeah absolutely totally agree um okay and my last question because you've already talked about i mean this whole friend group is always (laughs) always <laughs> sideways toxic there really isn't one person that's kind of bringing all this in together and b is literally just like reacting to all this new information that's happening to her um but there is a quote that uh sophie says and she was like feelings are facts and jordan was like no facts are facts so can you just like elaborate <laughs> on that talk about that how do you feel about oh, that? oh my god yeah that one set me off uh <laughs> mostly because this comes up like all the time I actually say this specifically like to my clients feelings aren't facts and to break that down further it's not that feelings aren't valid like feelings are like how we are reacting to things and like that like we are entitled to react however based on whatever's happening but like that's our that's our subjective reaction to what's happening that's That's our perception of what's happening. We are making meaning of like a situation that has happened, but that's in response to like the objective situation. So like, it's not, it's not facts. It's, Mm -hmm. it's the consequence of a situation. So, um, and I say that as like a way to like challenge what then happens. Like if you are, if you're feeling some type of way that can influence like how you're thinking about things. This is like coming from like a a cognitive behavioral approach where it's like Mm -hmm. our our emotions, our feelings and our thoughts influence each other like all the time. Um, And so like we might be thinking a certain thing and then that might make us feel some type of way and vice versa. We might be feeling anxious about something. Like these are like examples that I experience where like I physically feel anxious, like emotionally, but also in my body. And Mm -hmm. then I start having anxious thoughts And so that doesn't necessarily mean that there's like something I need to be concerned about in that moment. Like Sunday scaries. Like I get Sunday scaries all the time. 
on Sundays and Mondays and Tuesdays, and any day that and why. <laughs> and then, and then it starts. And then I start thinking about all these things that like, oh, should I be worried because this is going to happen? Do I need to be anxious about that thing? And it's like, if you actually take stock in that moment, there's no impending doom. There is no danger. Like I'm sitting on my couch watching a movie that we probably need to watch to record this podcast. Like nothing is happening. Yes. So yes. like those, those feelings are not like actually objective, hard, like factual pieces of information. Um, do you think, and, and sorry, just to add to that, do you think maybe people kind of confuse that when, when um, people say your feelings are valid and some people might take that I, yes. as saying like feelings are facts then because my yeah. feelings are valid. Yeah. Your feelings are valid. Mm -hmm. Like, again, it's like, I think there's a difference between like affirming how you feel mm -hmm. and also stating that like, no, like this feeling that I'm having, like is the objective truth. And it's like, that's that's no that's subjective but like yes. you are allowed to feel however based on like you're gonna feel some type of way about something and that might look differently from how i feel about it and so mm -hmm. like which what reality is real we're both entitled to feel how we want to feel um right and and like that's based on our experiences our perception of things like i you know i might be looking through the world through rose colored lenses you might be looking through the world through like poopy colored lenses and like yes. that will inform <laughs> how we are perceiving the same situation um mm -hmm. and again might influence how we feel about it and that might be different but the actual facts in that situation is the situation itself not our reaction to it and be careful yeah. of those poopy glasses because <laughs> you can get pink eye and then have rosy glasses <laughs> god <sighs> So disgusting. I knew as soon yes. as I said something like that, you were going to conjure something up. You, That's you, what it is. Yeah, poopy glasses. <laughs> but okay. yes, our, your yes. feelings can be valid. Right. But those are, they're not facts. They're not. They are all subjective. Don't think that it is from an objective point of Fish view. Fish are Got friends, it. not food. Not food. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that's all that I have. Should we rotten to mutton this? Let's do it. Rotten to mutton. The Tomatoes game. <laughs> okay, so what do you two think this has on Rotten Tomatoes? Lay it on me. I'm gonna say 88. All right, Jamie. I'm gonna say 91. This has an 86% on Rotten Tomatoes critic score. Surprisingly, the audience score is 69%. Nice. Um, uh, the critics' consensus is impeccably cast and smartly written. Bodies, Bodies, Bodies is an uncommonly well done whodunit. Yep. Yeah. And then the audience says... It may resonate more with younger audiences, but Bodies, Bodies, Bodies is one horror comedy that doesn't skimp on scares or laughs. Yeah. I don't know. That sounds better than 90, 69% to me. Nice. All right. <laughs> it's also so interesting, too, just thinking about, like, who the target audience is. And, like, every movie doesn't need to appeal to every single... Totally. Oh, Absolutely. You know demographic you know yeah. or whatever it's just like let it be for the young kids and still appreciate it you know appreciate the screenplay appreciate what it is for what it is definitely um cool what do you think this has on what's the other thing letterbox letterbox yeah what's the other thing don't you talk about this thing all the time yeah i know my brain's <laughs> just firing on half cylinders um <laughs> all right Millennial life. yeah jamie you go first what do you think this has out of five I'm going to guess 3.6. All right, Nikisha. I'm going to guess 2.9. Oh. Uh, this has a 3.3. .3. Hmm. And here are some of the most liked popular reviews. Quote, upper, upper middle class is used as effectively as a racial slur in this movie. Screaming. <laughs> yes. Um, another one is, this is A24's Among Us. 
Mm. Um, and the most popular review on Letterboxd is strongest character was the iPhone battery that lasted an entire night with the flashlight on. I okay, I did think about that, and yes. I I just kind of was like, you know what, I'm gonna let it go because I do enjoy this movie. But I was like, there's no flipping way that her phone, no one's talking about how their phones are dying. Mm -hmm. In the entire thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, are there portable chargers? uh, chargers? And then I was thinking about everyone being in the rain. But I think Bees was like in a little case the whole time. Mm -hmm. She's wearing the like thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I also feel like was a really like coy way of showing the difference in like socioeconomic status because her phone was like secured around her like she wasn't going to lose it she wasn't going to drop it like Mm -hmm. she was protecting it and like keeping it safe because phones are expensive and yes absolutely like that was not the case with everybody else i also didn't clock what kind of phone people had because i do try to pay Mm. attention to that because of the secret that i learned about apple will not let villains use iphones um, oh yeah so that's my that's like i keep that that's like a a little easter egg when i watch movies is like all right who's got the iphone and who's got like the miscellaneous other phone that mm-hmm. that we're not referencing absolutely mm-hmm. which is so funny because now i'm thinking that like i really don't see a lot of iphones it's always like android-esque especially like in scan the tv show scandal so random but like everyone no matter who like and they would show like pan on the phone was like an android and i'm like y'all live y'all are in washington dc and I, like y'all don't have iphones okay cool got it <laughs> very interesting uh but yes let us do the four s's four s's Skull, scare shakes and suggestions the talking horns four s's <laughs> All right, the four S's are skulls, scares, shakes, and suggestions. Um, skulls is how well this movie handles mental health, human behavior. Scares is how scary was it. Shakes is how much will this stick with you? Can you shake it off or not? And then suggestions, we'll go through those. But Jamie, let's start with you and your skull, scares, and uh, uh, shakes. Yeah, for skulls, I gave this a seven. Because um, I just feel like these characters do feel real and they scare me. Um, and <laughs> took some points away for, you know, some of the various like shenanigans that, that do happen. Um, but otherwise I, they stress me out. Okay. Um, for scares, I'm kind of torn between a three and a four because I, I definitely was way more tense watching this movie the first time around. Um, mm. and this time I was not afraid, like there was like zero fear in me. Except for again that like they just collectively scare me, but um, so I sure. I guess like a three five I want to give it as like, yeah, sure. for the first watch, um, and for shakes I gave this a seven. Like this movie really stuck with me. Um, I it stuck with me the first time, and then it was just interesting that I got like a different watch out of it. So I feel mm. like it's it, I mean it's definitely something that I will continue to recommend to people. It's a movie that I will continue to think about as just like a really iconic um gen z horror comedy mm-hmm. absolutely N- nikisha what about you yeah it's very similar uh seven also for skulls uh three for scares and uh shakes i gave it a six i really enjoy it um all right i gave it a uh seven also for um skulls i i gave it a 2.5 for scares um, and I give a 7.5 for shakes. Um, yeah, I think it's great. And I'll I'll go first with the suggestions. You need to watch season three, episode seven of Girls, Beach House. Oh, God. Beach House is one of the <laughs> best girls episodes. It feels, it, it it's like, it's, it's this episode, it's this movie. It, uh, they talk about, all the girls are screaming at each other about like, that's the issues that they have with each other and then at the end they basically pose the question like would we be friends if we weren't friends already like we didn't know each other Mm. forever like Mm. it's it's a it's it's my favorite episode of girls hands down and that's my beach house is my suggestion nice jamie what about you um so 
I kind of referenced or alluded to it uh, for a movie that I think really a lot of millennials, but also Gen Xers identify with and was made by and for Gen Xers scream. Yeah. Um, just like thinking about like whether the what's an iconic horror movie that like a generation really identifies with. Mm-hmm. Um, and then for I also wanted to give like a whodunit rec. Sure. Um, so the Knives Out series. Nice. Um, less horror focus, but I think has enough of the similar like comedy vibes and uh, definitely like that. Sh- those are just whodunits mm-hmm. um, that I feel like have similar humor. Yeah, along those same lines, uh, but more just in the comedy is Clue because it's just mm. hilarious and a great funny whodunit. And along the same lines, Jamie, I put Scream 4, but mostly ah. just for the surprise uh, who did it thing. Sure, sure. If you haven't seen Scream 4, which yeah. I think is quickly like one of my favorites besides the OG. I just really like Scream 4. Sure. Yeah. Great. Well, that wraps up our episode of Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. You can follow us on all social medias, Instagram, Twitter, and the infamous TikTok that killed Pete Davidson, uh, at Talk Horror Pod, <laughs> P-O-D. To and... clarify, our TikTok did not kill Pete Davidson. Yeah, I want to be super clear about that. <laughs> Just the TikTok. Um, and Pete Davidson also being on drugs, but that's another story. And... Uh, Brian, where can they listen to us? You can listen to us wherever you get podcasts. Perhaps you're on YouTube. Hi, YouTube. You can listen to us and watch us there. Perhaps you're on a thing called Spotify. We are there. Maybe you're Apple Podcasts. Uh, Go for it. Find us there. Rate and review us there. Five stars, please. And thank Thank you. And Brian, you have to just end with the podcast quotes. Oh, yeah. They, just need, they need to know how hard this is. Hanging out with your smartest and funniest friend. Um, a podcast, first of all, a podcast takes a lot of work, okay? You have to organize the guests. You have to do a Google calendar, and you have to find a following. It takes a long fucking time, and I've been working on it for a while. <laughs> oh, so That's good. Us. I fucking yes. love Amazing. this movie. That's We're us. Hashtag doing our, hashtag yes. doing Thanks our best. for listening. Don't roll your eyes at us. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. 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 <laughs>